Good morning. This morning we are continuing our journey through Colossians. We will be finishing up chapter one today. Small recap for context, Paul is writing this letter to a church that he's never been to. He's heard about this church in Colossae from Epaphras who's visiting him, but he's in jail and so he's never met them, but he's writing this letter to encourage them, to strengthen them, to guide them in their walk. We'll be looking at chapter one, verses 24 to 29. You can go ahead and turn there while I give a brief overview. Broadly speaking, this passage is Paul's introduction to his ministry. Like I said before, he's never been to the church of the Colossians. Um, He's never met them. And so this introduction is very important. If he wants them to hear his message, he has to give a a proper introduction. And so as we break down this passage, he begins kind of in the position that he's been given, the office that he has received from God. And then he kind of moves into the message that he preaches, what this... um, message from God that he's received, and then he works into the efforts uh, that he has put forth to fulfill his responsibilities for the sake of God, the efforts that he has um, put forth. And finally, after we kind of go through the passage, I find that Paul has some, um, some clear understandings of the church in this passage, how he views the church. And so I want to take a little bit of time, I want to step back and I want to look at um, Paul's understanding of the church um, just in conclusion. But before we can do any of that, we have to look at verse 24. At first glance, verse 24 seems to contradict the core basics of our faith. And I think you'll understand when we get there. But um, with that, if you would stand with me for the reading of God's word, we'll read and then I'm going to prayer, pray quickly, and then we will jump right in. Colossians 1, starting in verse 24. I am now rejoicing in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am completing what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. I became its servant according to God's commission that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. The mystery that has been hidden throughout the ages and generations, but has now been revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It is he whom we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone in all wisdom so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil and struggle with all the energy that he powerfully inspires within me. Father, I pray that these words would take root in our hearts today, that it would change our lives. We thank you for your word, in Jesus' name, amen. So before we can really move into the outline that I gave you, we have to deal with this verse 24. Verse 24 says, I am now rejoicing in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am completing what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. The core of our faith is built upon the belief that Jesus' death and resurrection is enough for salvation. If we spell out the gospel and we say that God created us to be with him and our sins separate us from him and we know that our sins cannot be removed by anything that we do but that Jesus died and rose again on our behalf and that is enough for us to receive forgiveness and reconciliation with God. But here Paul is saying I'm completing what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. So what more do we need? What exactly is lacking in Christ's sufferings? Is it not just faith alone in Jesus? Well, no, that's not the case. In fact, if you just back up one and two verses, Paul has just clearly said that Christ is enough. Allow me to read what Kelsey preached on last week, verses 22 and verses 23. He has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death so as to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable before him, provided that you continue securely established and steadfast in the faith. If you go forward to chapter 2, verses 8 to 15, he will say something quite similar. Paul makes it clear that 
Jesus' death and resurrection is indeed sufficient for our salvation. So what then does he mean? It's not altogether clear. Commentators don't agree. Um, I'm gonna share three different ideas with you. Uh, The one that I find the most uh, reasonable, but um, the first idea is that the Bible throughout the New Testament shares that we as believers share unity with Christ. That we, when we put our faith in him, we, we become in him and he dwells within us. And so through that union, we suffer with Christ and Christ suffers with us. And so while Christ's suffering on the cross may have been enough for our salvation, his suffering is not yet complete. So Paul is saying his suffering is adding to the completion of Christ's suffering. Another idea is the, there, throughout the Bible there's this theme that God will not do something before something reaches its fullness. In Genesis 15, 16, he says he will not drive out the Amorites before their iniquities have reached their fullness. Matthew 24, 14 says that Jesus will not return until all the world has heard the gospel. In um, early early Christian thought, there was the idea that Christ would not return until God's people had filled up the cup, cup of suffering. And so there is the thought that Paul is talking about his own sufferings are adding to this cup so that others do not have to suffer as much. The final option I want to present to you is the one that I find the most um, appealing. If you look at the Bible, if you look at the Old Testament, if you look at the New Testament, God's actions are to establish a people for himself. It's to bring the world back to himself. And so when he was establishing the nation of Israel, he was establishing them so that they would reach out and become a light to the world. They would be a holy nation that would follow him, that would draw the world to himself. Ultimately, so that Jesus could come and he could become the full revelation of God. And when you see Jesus' life, it's the same thing. He's reaching out and he's drawing people back to God. He's reconciling the world and ultimately he's establishing the church. And so while Jesus' life and death were enough to provide a way to God, they have not yet fully established the church. His work is not yet complete because the world has not yet been reconciled. And so the thought is that Paul in his suffering for the sake of the gospel is completing the work that Christ left unfinished. Christ's death and resurrection provides the way, but the church has not been complete. The world has not been saved. And so Paul suffers for the sake of Christ's goal. I believe within the context of the passage, this makes the most sense If you look forward to verse 28, Paul is saying, I do all of this so that everyone may be mature in Christ. Um, Now, I believe this is the most, uh, this makes the most sense. It could be one of the other ones I shared. It could be none of them. The most important thing to know about this passage is that the Bible is clear. Jesus is enough for our salvation. In fact, he's the only way for our salvation. It is only by faith in him that we accept this gift of grace from God. Nothing else can save us. We can add nothing to Christ's gift. Now that we have dealt with verse 24, we can move back to my outline of Paul's position, his message, and his efforts. Verses 24 and 25. I am now rejoicing in my suffering for your sake, and in my flesh I am completing what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. I became its servant according to God's commission that was given to me for you, to make the word of God fully known. At the very beginning of his letter, Paul introduced himself as an apostle by the will of God. And here again, he says that my position is given to me by God. He's tying his authority to God himself. This is not a position that Paul chose for himself. 
This is not a position that Peter assigned him or any of the other apostles. This is a position that God himself gave Paul. And Paul explains that this position came with certain responsibilities. He says he suffers for the sake of the church, he's a servant of the church, and he lives to make the word of God fully known. These are the tasks associated with his office. And so, as he says that I strive to make the word of God fully known, the question soon arises, well, what is this word of God? And so he tells them in verses 26 and 27 what this message is. He says, this mystery that has been hidden throughout the ages and generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We don't know a whole lot about the church of Colossae. Um, But from the letter, it seems that they had this tendency to want to add to Christ's work. Paul warns them consistently that they should not fall into this temptation of observing Sabbaths and new moons, festivals, worship of angels. There's all these things that they seem to think might aid in their salvation or aid in their sanctification. And Paul consistently warns against these. They had this fear that maybe Christ's death was not enough. There was something more that they were missing. And so Paul introduces himself as a bearer of God's great mysteries. He says, I have the secret that that has been hidden for centuries. God has kept this mystery that I now have. God has now revealed it to me and to his saints and I preach this mystery. But it's not just, it's not just an ancient mystery. It's an ancient mystery filled with riches and glory. This is a secret of secrets. And it's now available to the Gentiles as well. To a people who were fearful that they were missing something. Hearing that Paul had this great secret must have been quite tempting. What is this secret knowledge that we are missing? What must we do to attain it? So finally Paul reveals this mystery. He says this mystery is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Turns out... He bears no extra secret. It's the same message he's preached from the beginning and he'll continue to preach. It's the same message they've heard and they've believed in. That Jesus came, he died, and he rose again on their behalf. And that they have reconciliation with God through his death and resurrection. There's no great mystery. There's no secret knowledge, no special rituals or ceremonies. It's simply what they've heard already. The mystery is something that was hidden because we could not understand, but now is clearly revealed. It's not something that we have to figure it out. It's just something that we could not understand, but now has become clear. Now, I have just spoken as if this mystery is nothing profound, that it's nothing special, but in fact, it's just the opposite. The fact that from the beginning, God intended to send himself in the form of man to save his creation is beyond astounding. But it's not just Jesus. Paul says the mystery is Christ in you. You see, we are part of God's plan for salvation. God's plan was to send Jesus but then he was going to redeem the world through Jesus' followers. He was going to do the work of saving the world through those who put their faith in Jesus. Paul said, I have received this position from God, but you have received a role too. You are a part of this great mystery that God will save the world through. Paul provides this message of hope. Sorry, not hope. Yes, hope, but Paul provides this message of power 
of simplicity, but also hope. He says, the message is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Hope is something that's not yet attained. It's looking forward with anticipation to the promise of what God has promised to us. If you look forward again to verse 28, Paul is looking to present everyone complete in Christ, perfect in Christ. But here he's saying, I recognize that we will be incomplete. We will not reach fullness in this world until Christ returns, until we meet him face to face, there will be limitations. But we have hope. God has promised us this. And so we live out this mystery. Through God's power, we, say, we are working to save the world and we live with the hope that God will return and we will live in fullness with him. The message that Paul brings is one of power, it's one of simplicity, and it's one of hope. Finally, after he draws the people in with this message, he ends with the efforts that he has put forth for the church. He says, it is he whom we proclaim, warning everyone, teaching everyone in all wisdom so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil and struggle with all the energy that he powerfully inspires within me. So I've kind of pointed forward to verse 28 a couple times and so now we are going to finally take a little bit more of a glance at Paul's goal. At the end of 28 he says, my, so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. That is his goal, that is his vision. So what does he mean by that? Well, the word he uses for mature can be translated as complete or perfected, but it, all of these carry this idea of growth. To Paul, it is not enough that people simply enter into the kingdom of heaven. It is not enough for people to just become saved, to put their faith in Jesus, but they must grow in their walk with God. They must grow in their knowledge of God. They must grow in their righteousness. They must learn how to live lives that are pleasing to God. They must learn how to live a life fully in Christ. So how does Paul go about making this happen? Well, he gives three actions and then the strategy by which he does them. He says, him we proclaim, being Jesus, warning everyone and teaching everyone in all wisdom. It is Jesus whom we proclaim. If you recall the last two sermons that Dan and Kelsey spoke of, or that Dan and Kelsey preached on, this is Jesus who God dwelt in fully. He was fully God and fully man. This is Jesus who created the world and through him all things still exist. This is that glorious man who we have redemption of sins, who through his death we are reconciled, we are made right with God. This is the Jesus we proclaim. But why warning and teaching? The warning is necessary because there's a harsh reality waiting for us, waiting for those who do not turn to Jesus. Paul is not advocating for scaring people into heaven or having a sign out there that says the world is going to hell, but to not warn somebody of impending disaster is to be without love. And that is the reality we face when we share the gospel. Paul loves the world, he loves God too much to not share the reality of life without God. That if we do not turn to Jesus, each and every one of us will find ourselves condemned before God. So if this warning is trying to open their eyes to the realities of the world, the teaching is trying to help them walk with God, to grow in their journey. Paul said he wants people to be mature in Jesus and so teaching them how to live that way instructing them, guiding them in how to grow 
in their walk with God. It is not enough for people to just be justified, they must also walk this path of sanctification. And so he proclaims the message of Jesus, and he warns everyone, and he teaches everyone. And I want you guys to appreciate Paul's emphatic use of the word everyone. Paul is not picky about who he preaches to. Paul is not choosing who listens to him. Paul understands that everyone is in need of Jesus and that everyone is deserving to hear of Jesus. From the highest ruler to the lowest beggar, everyone needs to hear the gospel. Everyone needs Jesus and Paul wants everyone to live in fullness of him. So in addition to these three actions, he, come, he gives the manner in which he does them. He says they do all these things in all wisdom. They are not mindlessly preaching. They are not just going out on the street corner and shouting to the masses. They are thoughtful in how they approach people. They devise strategies on how to best appeal to people. They are not changing their message but they are wisely choosing the way they present it. Throughout his letters, Paul encourages everyone to live at peace with their neighbors, to live honorable lives to even those outside of the church, to obey those in authority over them. He calls Christians to live lives where people have no choice but to admit the people of God are people filled with righteousness and honor. Paul shares his message with wisdom, with respect, with honor. But he does not do this on his own strength. In verse 29, he admits that it is not his own doing, but it is the, it is the power of God within him. He says, for this I toil and struggle with all the energy that he powerfully inspires within me. Paul began this passage relying on the authority that God has given him. This is a position given by God, but here in this passage, he's opening up his heart and he's revealing his weakness. He's revealing the exhaustion that he feels at times. And he says, I cannot do this on my own. I have no ability on my own to do this, but it is Christ in me. It is God who works these things through me. And so he presents both this power, the side of authority and this side that says, I am, I am no one special. I have been given this position, but I am just like you. I am just a man. And it is not my work, but it is God's work in my life. As we reach the end of this passage, I want to take some time and I want to look back over this, over this and um, look at Paul's understanding of the church. Um, there's two points that I want to talk about. Um, but as Paul is explaining his ministry to the church, there's some very telling signs as far as how Paul approaches them. The first is that Paul views the church as one united body. If you read verses 24 and 25, you can see that he uses you talking about the church of Colossians and the church talking about the broader body almost interchangeably. He says, I am now rejoicing in my suffering for your sake. And in my flesh, I am completing what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. I became its servant according to God's commission that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. Paul, in essence, is saying, what I do for one part of the body, I do for the whole of the body. I may not, may not have preached to you before, but I have preached to the church in Rome, and I have preached to the church in Jerusalem, and I have preached to these other bodies, and what I have done for them should give me authority with you. We are all one body, and when one part of the body suffers, 
the whole body suffers. And when one part of the body thrives, the whole body should celebrate. For much of church history, this mentality has carried with it. Um, The Roman Catholic Church, um, Catholic means broad or uh, all-inclusive. Understanding that we are all one body. That yes, there are physical congregations, but that we are united in Christ. We all serve one God and that we are one body. But today it seems we struggle with this idea. And I think we struggle with it on multiple levels. We struggle with it on an individual level. We struggle with it on a church and denominational level. And we struggle with it on an international level. Um, And I think there's natural reasons we struggle with each of these. But um, it's not easy. It doesn't come naturally. We have followed our pattern of culture and our faith has become greatly individualized to the point where a lot of people seem to think that their relationship with God is between them and God and it has no bearing or relationship with anyone else. And that's simply not the case. Paul would argue that if you place your faith in Jesus, you are automatically placed within the body of Christ. There's no opting out. There is no removing yourself from the body. You don't have a choice. Not that salvation is in the church, but that by being saved, you become a part of the church. And that by being a part of the church, you are both responsible to it and responsible for it. At a church and denominational level, we see ourselves as one body here at Farallon and In a lot of ways that is correct, but I think we often struggle to look outside and see other churches as more than just another church, as more than just cousins in our walk with God, but true brothers and sisters. We see the differences in theology and beliefs, differences in the way we worship and we find it different and weird and we wonder, can they really be a part of the same body? And we struggle at an international level because in a lot of ways, the church is just so massive. In Paul's day, they were a small minority of the Roman, pop, Roman Empire. The Roman Empire's population was somewhere between 40 and 120 million. I, don't, I haven't dug for these numbers, okay? So I, they might be off. But anyways, church, or Christian estimates today put the population for Christians somewhere north of 2 billion. And so of course it seems difficult to feel any any serious closeness and love towards our fellow billions worth of brothers and sisters. It would be exhausting simply to keep tabs on what the church is doing across the world. But I believe that we can cultivate a heart that loves and cherishes the universal body of Christ. When our missionaries come back, when the team comes back from Kenya, when the youth come back from Costa Rica, when Courtney returns from Thailand, when we listen to their stories, does it fill us with hope and prayer and thankfulness to God? Or do we walk away and think, oh, I guess that's interesting? When we hear about the persecutions going on in other nations, do we stop and pray for our brothers and sisters? Or do we move on thinking, I'm glad I don't live there? I believe there is great strength, encouragement, and challenges to be taken and growth from our brothers and sisters around us. No one person is perfect. No one church body is perfect. We all have our shortcomings. We all have our weaknesses. Even Peter needed to be corrected by Paul at times. But that is the beauty of the body. 
That where one is falling short, another can pick them up. Where one church struggles, another flourishes. Paul sees the church as one body. And he loves them enough, and that is what gives him the ability to write this letter. Because he's never met this church. But he views them as his brothers and sisters, and he wants to encourage them, and so he writes this letter. He says, I, I don't know you, but I've heard about you, and I pray for you all the time. I love you, and I want you to grow in your, in your walk with God. You can see on my slide that I have two main points. The second I've talked about a little bit, but Paul sees the church as God's grand vision and his incomplete work. From the beginning of the Bible to Revelation, God is going about creating a people who will live in community with him, who will love him, who will follow him, who will live with him. And Paul sees the church as God's final goal. This gathering of believers who will love each other and love God. But the church is not yet complete. But Paul can envision its, its completion. Paul looks forward to what God has promised, saying there's a day when the church will be made whole, when the world will be made right, and we will live in unity with God. Paul has heard this grand vision and it has captured his heart. And so he works with passion to make that grand vision reality. The completion of the church is the future that God has promised. And Paul is desperate to make that happen. Paul's description of his ministry is his attempt to convey this passion to the church. He is trying to express his earnestness, his desire that the Colossians would listen to him. Because we are all one body and we all should love each other, encourage one another, and listen to one another. He shares about his position, his mission, his message and his efforts so that they might hear and listen and grow in passion as well. Pray with me. Jesus, we thank you um, that you have promised a day when we will live with you in fullness. A day when your church will be complete, when we will be lacking in nothing. And so we wait eagerly and we pray that you would give us the energy, the humility to work with our brothers and sisters, to love each other, to help each other grow in our walk. Lord, I pray that you would bless us this week. May you reveal your working in our hearts. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.